So this past Friday, we did something that was um, totally awesome, actually a dream come true for me, okay? In fact, we did it with my family and my brother and sister-in-law and uh, niece and nephews and, um, and then my mother and father-in-law, and, and I, I have to tell you, it was such an epic thing that when we were finished, I told them I've never been more proud of you. I'll tell you what we did. We did the Butler County Donut Trail. It was awesome. If you guys don't know this about me, I love donuts. I love them. I love donuts. I love to eat donuts. I love to look at donuts. There's anything with a hole with sweetness, man, it's awesome, right? But I'm going to be honest with you for a second. The way we did the donut trail was we wanted to do it all in one day. Now, you could spread it out. What it is is there's actually nine stops on it, and you get a passport. And then you go in these participating donut shops, and when you buy the donut, they stamp it. Now, you could spread it out if you want to be wimpy and do it over the course of a few weeks. But we preferred to get up early, so we met at 5 a.m. on Friday, and we were ready to go eat some donuts. Now, there were nine stops on the way, but one of them was being remodeled. Very sad. I heard it was a very good donut shop. The other one, they gave you a free stamp, so we only had to go to seven donut shops. That's not a big deal, right? Not a big deal at all. In fact, as we were going and and taking off, I just, like, I was excited, And, and so we... We stopped at the first one, and, you know, we get our donut, and they're stamping, and it's exciting. Over 2,000 people have done the donut trail, and when you get finished with it, you go to Butler County's Visitor Bureau when they, we went right when they opened at 8.30 on Friday, and you get a t-shirt, which is, I'm going to wear it with pride later today. It's the greatest shirt ever, right? I worked hard for that, but here I am, someone who loves donuts, and I'm on this donut trail with my family, and we're going around. Some of the donut shops were like a mile and a half apart. So you don't get a long time between. So you're eating a big donut, and you get to the next one, and you're like, oh, man, here we go. And you just keep going, right? Now, now some people in our group decided they weren't going to eat all of them. They were going to take some home, and that was kind of wimpy. I felt like if you're going it, you just got to eat it every time you go. You eat the donut. So I ate a few extra, like little pieces here and there, try this and all that. And being someone that loved donuts, I started feeling a little bit sweeted out. Do you know what I'm talking about, where you're just like, man, I, I'm, I don't know about this, you know. But I kept pushing on because I just love donuts. And then we stopped at one. Now, this is about halfway through, and uh, I don't know the name of it, which is probably good if you ever do the donut trail. And someone in our group, when we got out in the parking lot, they said they saw a fly in one of the donut cases, right? I didn't give it any second thought. We were just, just rolling, and I had a, a, a chocolate cake donut that was glazed, and we're driving down the road. And I mean, it wasn't the best donut I've ever had by any stretch. You know, it's just, it's okay, a little bit sweeted out. And then I bit into my donut. And let me just pause for a minute and let you know this. I'm not somebody that's really freaked out by hairs. Like if I'm eating my food and there's a big hair and whatever, it doesn't bother me. I just pull it out, floss, and then just keep eating. Doesn't bother me, right? But here I am eating this donut, and I'm eating it, and it wasn't just a hair. It was like a colony of hairs. Like I bit into it, and I was like, and I pulled it out. And the only way I could describe it to you, it was like if I went to a beauty salon or a barber shop, and I just grabbed some off the floor, I don't know where the hair came from. I don't know. But as I'm eating, it was full in my mouth, and I'm just like, Whoa! and my wife is dying laughing, and the kids are dying laughing, and I'm a little bit sweeted out anyway, and I start thinking, man, I don't feel so good right now. Didn't throw up. That would be totally wimpy. But I did throw that rest of that little donut out, right, the rest of that piece. And then we, we went on with the rest of it, but it was like just such a weird, in your mouth kind of thing. We got home after doing this. Now, we, so we ate seven donuts and a little bit more, whatever. And have you ever been on just a sugar high, and then you get on the sugar low? And you're like, honestly, I didn't know what my body was doing. I'm like, man, I don't know. We laid down to take a nap, and I got up after about an hour. I'm like, man, I'm going to throw up. I feel, and I'm like, nope, I'm good. I'm good. You know, and I didn't, my body had no idea what was happening. But as I thought about this donut trail, I thought about that's so much like life for us. So many times in our life, we're on this trail, this trek, seeking our own sweet pleasures, the things that we want. And what so many, so many times happens to us as we're on this, this selfish kind of a trail or journey is we end up with a bitter taste in our mouth and feeling a little bit unsettled inside. Because that's not how God made us to be. Let me say this. Nothing wrong with blessings. Nothing wrong with with luxuries, nothing wrong with, with making money, vacations, certainly nothing wrong with donuts. That is straight from God. That's a gift. Nothing wrong with any of that. But we have to understand that's not the focus of our life. If we ever make that the focus of our life, we are very quickly going to experience how bitter life can be, how unsettled it can feel, and even sometimes how sickening it can be. 
Because God created us to align our lives with Him, to desire Him, to seek His face. And when we do that, it changes us from the inside out. When we do that, we can experience what I would call being beyond blessed. And today as we continue worshiping, we're going to take a look at, at this whole thought process of being beyond blessed. As we continue worshiping, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you so much for the opportunity you've given us right now to be in your house. Lord, to come as a whole church family, kids included, and just worship you and love you. And Lord, as we come to this time where we open your word, Father, we pray that you would help it to come alive. Father, we pray that you would help us to, to understand the truth found in your word. And Lord, to apply it to our life. Because Lord, every single one of us in this room want to experience what it's like to be beyond blessed. And Lord, we know that that only comes through you. We love you, Father. We pray all this in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 10, beginning with verse 10. And, and I want to just say, this is just a verse we're going to start today off with. I shared it in last week's sermon, but there's so much for us in this verse. John 10, 10, the Scripture says, these are the words of Jesus, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Let's read it one more time. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Now what Jesus is referencing here is the thief. He's talking about Satan. Another way to think about it is Satan and the things of this world come only to steal and kill and destroy. But he's come that we may have life and have it to the full. If you've got a different translation of the Bible, it may say here he's come to give us abundant life. Now, I want to make sure you understand what this means. This doesn't mean that Jesus is coming to add days to our life. That's not what it means at all. He's not adding days, weeks, or years to our life. What he is doing is making our life purposeful, meaningful, exciting, helping us to feel beyond blessed as we live our life instead of going on our own life trail, as I mentioned, seeking sweet pleasures and things that are going to go away one day. There's a different plan and purpose for our life. Now, before we go any further, I want to pause for just a minute, and I just want to talk for a second with you about kind of the world today. As I've been looking at the events um, on every landscape, whether it be political, whether it be terrorism, whether it be um, social um, issues and, and things from Dallas police shootings, police brutality, everything in between, here's the one thing that I've heard that seems to be constant. People are saying, what in the world is going on? What is happening in our world today? In fact, people are looking at it from so many different things. Social media, you'll see like right now, if we pull up anybody's Facebook, there's all kinds of posts of people saying, what in the world is happening? I don't know what's happening. I feel so unsettled. And, and I don't want to make light of any of this stuff. These are serious things. In fact, we talked about them on this donut trail while we're stuffing our face with donuts, just about how strange things are right now. But I want to remind each and every one of us that God is bigger than it all. God is bigger than terrorism. He's bigger than, than people that make sinful decisions to hurt innocent people, whether it be terror attacks or whether it be police shootings in Dallas. He's bigger than anything that we will ever see or experience on the political landscape. He's bigger than anything that we will ever face in our personal lives, in the life of our country, and in the world in general. The problem is this. We get so caught up going on our own trail, seeking our own selfish pleasures and sweet desires, that we forget that God's in control. We're not in control, but what's really cool is God's in control, and He's big enough to handle it all. All we have to do is align our lives with Him. When we align our lives with Him and begin to submit to Him, He begins to work through us, and we begin to say and feel as though we are beyond blessed, even when things are going on in the world that we don't understand. My hope and my prayer for each of us is as we look in God's Word today, that we will make that conscious decision that we're not going to live for just our own desires anymore, but we're going to open our life, open our heart, open our soul so that God can begin to work through us and we can experience this full life that he's promised us. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 6. 
We're going to begin with verse 30. I just want to prep you ahead of time. What I'm about to read to you, almost every single one of you, if not every single one of you, have heard this account. But because it's familiar, don't check out. Don't just gloss over it in your mind or don't fade out into something else. Stay with me on this. Mark chapter 6, begin verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So let's set the scene for just a minute. What happened right before this, Jesus sent his apostles out. He sent them out to serve in the world, to love on people, heal people, do all this. They come back to Jesus, and they're so excited to share with them what God has been doing through them. As they're sharing with them, they're tired, they're hungry. But in typical fashion, they're coming to Jesus, and everyone else is coming to Jesus and seeing them. And the Scripture says so many people were coming that the apostles didn't even have a chance to stop and to get something to eat. Jesus, knowing that, look what he says to them. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Jesus says, let's, let's separate out and let's get some rest. You guys are tired. Let's keep reading, verse 32. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd, so he began teaching them many things. So Jesus says to him, hey, you guys are tired. You're not even getting a chance to eat. I know you're hungry. Hey, let's go in a, to a solitary place. They get on the boat, and they're going down the water, and people recognize them, and they start running along the shore. I see them, and they're going down the shore. More people see it, and more and more keep following them, so much so that when they get there, their boat makes landfall, and as they step off the boat, now a huge crowd's waiting for them again. And Jesus, seeing them, having compassion on them, as the Scripture says, seeing that they were like sheep without a shepherd, he begins teaching them. Now, what you have to understand, if Jesus is starting to teach them things, the apostles are right there with him. So here they are, they're not getting to rest, they're not getting to eat, and they're right back where they started. Verse 35. By this time, it was late in the day. So his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. Now, let's just stop here for a second. So here we have the apostles, they're tired and they're hungry. Jesus knows that. But there's this need in front of them that Jesus wants to meet. So they're still ministering, loving, teaching, sharing with the people. But then as it starts to get late, the apostles come to share some great revelation with Jesus. And they say, hey, hey Jesus, it's getting late. And we're out in this remote place. See all these people? We better send them away so they can still get something to eat before everybody um, goes to bed, before everything gets shut down. And Jesus said, now they think Jesus is going to go, oh, you got a good point, let's do that. Instead, Jesus says, you find them something to eat. Now the apostles were, were perplexed by that. In fact, they even say back to him, that would take more than eight months of a man's wages. Now, just pause for a second. Think about how much food it, we, that we're talking about, if it would cost eight months of your family's wages. That's a lot of chicken nuggets, isn't it? That's a lot. That's what Jesus, that's what they say to Jesus. And again, they're expecting Jesus to go, oh, didn't think about that. Why don't we send him away? Instead, Jesus says to them, what do we have here? Go and see. Now, you can imagine the apostles as they're walking around like, go and see. What are you talking about? This is, there's so much humanity here. We're not going to have enough food for them. And as they go, you know how it goes. They find five loaves and two fish. They come back to Jesus and tell him that, five loaves and two fish. Do you know what they're expecting? Jesus to go, oh, that's not enough. We better send them away. Right? But again, what does Jesus do? Verse 39. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. 
Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten was 5,000. 5,000. 5,000 men, not counting women and children. Probably it was more close to a 12,000 in number. Let that sink in for a minute. Picture the scene for a minute. They, Jesus, he says, go and see, what do we have? They come up, they say, five loaves and two fish. So they, they, they bring it up to Jesus, and then Jesus has, have the people sit. He directs them to sit in groups. Then Jesus picks up the fish and the loaves, and he begins to bless them. Think for just a minute. Put yourself in this story. What were the people doing? The 12,000 people. They're sitting in groups now, and then they're looking up, and they see Jesus with five loaves and two fish, and he's blessing them. I bet you what some people at least said was, are we just going to watch Jesus eat? Looks like he's getting ready to eat. He's blessing it. Not even realizing this great miracle that's about to happen. Think about the apostles for a minute. Jesus says, sit them down. So the apostles are going out and they're saying, hey, everyone sit down in groups of hundreds and fifties. I'm sure people said, why? And they were probably saying, because Jesus said so. Jesus said so, just do it. You have all these people being obedient to what Jesus said and the apostles being obedient even when it didn't make sense. Nothing about this story makes sense. We think it does because we've heard it so many times. It doesn't make sense. It just doesn't. But then Jesus blesses it, and as he brings it down, he begins to break it off and to begin to separate it to the apostles, and he says, go feed them. Have you ever thought about how bizarre that is? Have you ever put yourself in the moment? For instance, Peter, Jesus breaks this, this bread. There's only five loaves. There's 12 apostles. They're breaking off little pieces. So, so here, Peter's got a, a piece of bread and a piece of a fish, and he's walking up to these groups of people, and he's thinking, okay, okay. And he starts to, to break it off and to give it to them. I don't know how this miracle happened. I don't know. I don't know if when he broke the bread and he handed it, all of a sudden it expanded into a whole loaf. I don't know if as he broke it and handed it, it grew back. I'll tell you the truth. If I was there, I'd be looking, wouldn't you? How's this happening? What's going on? I'd be like, I mean, what happens if I eat it? Is it happening in my stomach now? You know, I, it's such a weird moment, right? But we read it like nothing's happening. We read it so familiar. We take the miracle out of the moment. And yet God is doing something remarkable. Let me expand your mind for just a minute if you haven't thought this way. First thing, first truth today, as we're wrestling with beyond blessed, God doesn't need you and God doesn't need me. And God certainly didn't need the apostles. Think about it for a second. Jesus is all powerful. I believe that. I know you believe that. He could have met this need any number of ways, right? He could have snapped his fingers and immediately taken away the hunger pain. So nobody's hungry anymore. He could have literally whispered a prayer and food could have just started popping up, double cheeseburgers right out of the ground for them all. He could have done that. In fact, God's done that before in the Old Testament, right, with manna. He could have done that. He could have said a different prayer, waved his hand, and the sky start raining food on these people. Jesus could have done it any number of ways, but instead he chose to use the apostles. He chose to use them, physically use them. Grab this food that I just blessed and start breaking it off and feed them. Let me tell you something. God loves to spend time with us. He loves to spend time with us. Jesus loved to spend time with his apostles. Everywhere he went, he had crowds of people. Even in this moment, the reason they're feeding people is Jesus pulled up on the boat, and they were all there, and he saw them, and he had compassion on them. He wanted to spend some time with them and be a blessing to them. God loves to spend time with the apostles then. He loves to spend time with you and I now. He doesn't need us. Don't ever let your twisted mind think for a second that God needs you. God wants to be close to you. God wants to spend time with you because he loves you, because that's why he created you, to have a relationship with you. That's incredible. That's awesome. Jesus could have fed these people any number of ways, but he wanted to let the apostles be part of this blessing. He wanted them to break off these pieces of bread and fish and to keep feeding people and keep going. Now, here's the part that we miss. Think about it for a second. There's 12 apostles. There's people everywhere. 12,000 people is a lot of people. Can you imagine as they're going, Peter's breaking it off, and as he keeps going and he's on maybe number 100, he's going to his next group, he's blown away. 
I, I promise you, he's smiling. I promise you, he's excited. I promise you, he keeps looking back at Jesus, and he keeps looking at the other apostles, and he's going, can you just picture it for a second? We read it in such a weird mindset, like he's like, there you go, there you go, there you go, there you go. This was a moment of worship. This was an exciting moment. Can you picture the people starting to cheer because they just saw Jesus bless five loaves and two fish? And now they're eating. And did you catch that the scripture says that they all ate and were satisfied? That word satisfied means they didn't just get a morsel. It means that they were full and didn't want for anything more. It means that they were literally like me on maybe stop three of the donut trail. I'm like, man, I'm good. I don't need anything else. But then I had to eat that hairy donut. I just couldn't, you know. That's, they were satisfied. They didn't need any more. God is so good. This was a worship time. These people, as they were eating and getting satisfied, they were celebrating too. The apostles were celebrating. And then it gets better because God's just a show off sometimes. He just loves to show off. Seriously, 12 basketfuls of scraps at the end? One for each apostle? Seriously? And, and it would have been as they worked through the crowd, and now they're coming up. They started with five loaves and two fish. Everybody saw it. And now there's 12 bushelfuls that are sitting around Jesus, and the apostles are bringing them up, setting them around Jesus. Here's a quick snapshot for you. What kind of expression was on Jesus' face as they were bringing them up to him? Immediately when I said all of you picture the picture, the, the typical Jesus picture, like, he wasn't doing that. I promise you, he was like smiling, laughing. Can you imagine when they got up there? I bet you anything. They high-fived, they hugged each other. I bet you some of the apostles were weeping. I bet you some of the people nearby were weeping and so excited because there was something incredible happening. The apostles, I promise you, they felt beyond blessed because when you allow God to work through you, you always feel beyond blessed. The sad truth most Christians never let God work through them. And they never feel what it's like to be beyond blessed. Instead, what most Christians feel is a sense of duty to come to church, check off the box, read my Bible a little bit, instead of just letting go of you navigating the trail of your life, seeking your own sweet desires and pleasures. Nothing wrong with nice things again, but that's not the end all. Christ is the end all. And when we let go of those things, enjoy them and have balance in our life, but make the desire and the focus of our life Christ, it changes us. And that's where we begin to feel God working through us, and we are beyond blessed. And when you're beyond blessed, it's addictive. And when you're beyond blessed, you know that God has just done something remarkable. Let me close with this. We just got back from the um, Amazon River missions trip. Um, I went there, um, I took my son Luke, my daughter Hannah, uh, Lauren Gentry, and Holly Shepard. And uh, we went down there, met up with some other churches. We got on this houseboat, and we're going down the Amazon River, literally with John boats. We'd stop at villages and get into the John boats sometimes and go up to other small houses along the river. And it was pure sharing the love of Christ. Walking up to people and asking them, hey, are you going to heaven or hell? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? And beginning to share with them. It was an amazing, amazing time there, and uh, so, so one day we were separated into different teams, so my team was actually my daughter Hannah and Lauren and Holly, and we had our interpreter, Dexter. My son Luke was on another team. There were a total of six teams, and we were doing different things in this village called Aztec, Aztec, and as we were there, it was, um, it was right after lunch, and if you don't know this, the Brazilians have siesta, even in the outlying villages, Right? And what that means is at lunchtime, between lunch and about 2.30, people eat and they rest. And if you go up to their houses, then you're not always going to catch them or you're not always going to have a warm welcome because you're interrupting, right? Well, here we were in, in this Aztec, and it was a, a built-up uh, city, not with buildings, but it was spread out, a lot of people there. And we're walking down these streets, and what we were going to do since it was during siesta was we were going to do street evangelism. If someone was out in the street, we were going to go up and talk with them. And then we were also going to be directing everybody back to the church a couple blocks away where we would be having a worship service at 7 o'clock. And as we're walking through the city streets, we, we shared with a few different people. We, we were on the sidewalk, and literally, here's the sidewalk. Right here is houses, and I, I won't go into all the details for brevity how strange it is over there. But there's like a, a covered porch with a table, and I could see the door open. There was a family in there about to eat something. And so we're sitting there, and there was a woman walking, walking 
uh, right in front of us, getting ready to go through there. And at first thought, I thought, we don't want to disturb it, Siesta. She's getting ready to go with her family. And we stood there talking for a minute, and she, she paused for just a minute. And then our interpreter, Dexter, said, let's talk to this woman. So we step in there, and we, we walk up, and Dexter starts the conversation. They're so hospitable, everybody that we met. They would grab chairs and set them out even if they didn't have one. And you have to sit in it, otherwise it's disrespectful. So, so we're all sitting in the chair on this one side of the, there's a table, and she's sitting on the other side, and everything goes through our interpreter. And on this particular time, Lauren was going to be sharing, uh, you know, point on it all. So, so she asked the key question that we always ask. In your personal opinion, what do you understand it takes to get to heaven? And that's the foundation. Their answer is what we de- how we decide what we're going to say next. And this woman says she believes that you have to have um, Jesus in your heart by grace and through faith. And let me tell you, that's a good answer, right? So we're like, man, that's great. So then we would always follow up with, are you 100% sure that if you died, you would go to heaven? Because we want to make sure that it's not just words they're saying, but they understand it. And this woman, through the interpreter, said, yes, absolutely. And so as team leader, when we hear that, I'm thinking, okay, this woman doesn't need Christ. So I say, I typically would say something like, um, you know, Dexter, ask her if there's anything we can pray for her or her family for before we leave so we can go on down the street. And as I start talking to Dexter, this woman interrupts and starts talking to Dexter and saying a bunch of stuff. And then Dexter, literally, after she shared for a few minutes, his face kind of just dropped, and he just starts looking at us for a minute. And he said, this woman is, woman is telling us that she is a, a person with strong faith in Jesus Christ. That every morning she gets up and spends time with God in prayer and studies her Bible. He said she told me that she's been struggling for the last few months. Didn't say what the struggle was. But she said on this morning, this day, when she opened her Bible, she read some verses. And in her prayer time, she felt like God gave an answer to her struggle. And God followed it with, Today, I'm going to send some people to your house to encourage you. Let me tell you something. When he said that, we looked at each other. I could see tears flowing. And I can't even describe to you the feeling beyond blessed to know that God is in that moment. That God brought us from Cincinnati, Ohio to Ozatech on the Amazon River to be an encouragement to a woman that we had never met, who we can't even talk to. We were an encouragement to her. As soon as we, she starts sharing that, we begin to talk. And I start telling her, we're going to be praying for you. We're going to be praying while you're building up your church and, and your faith here in Brazil. We're doing it back in the States. And as we keep talking, I recognize that this was a spiritual milestone that I and the girls on my team would never forget. Beyond blessed. Blessed. And I'm just going to be honest, I can't wait for the next moment. I'm excited for the next moment. But as I share that, many of you are looking at me right now and you've never felt that. And I'm not sharing it so you can go, oh, you guys are holy, good job. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I want you to want it. I want you to want it like I want it. I want you to experience beyond blessed, not just going through the motions of church. Because it is so different. Jesus is calling us to a full life, an abundant life. And for so many of us, we're content to just go through the drudgery of life on a trail seeking our own sweet desires. And we wonder why we don't feel excited inside. We wonder why sometimes we feel sick inside. We wonder why the events in the world bring us down so quickly. Let me tell you something. God is bigger than it all. And he's calling every single one of us. To align our lives with him. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need you and he doesn't need me. But he loves to spend time with us. And when we let go and let God work through us, we begin to understand what it really means to be beyond blessed, just like the apostles as they were feeding the 5,000. I don't know what God's speaking to you about. I'm going to say a prayer. We're going to have some deacons right down here at the front. If you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, step out. May today be the day that your eternity changes. For the rest of us, stop being satisfied. Stop being satisfied. God wants to show you things that will blow your mind. But he's not going to show you when you're just going through the motions and you're not willing to step out on faith. You say yes to whatever God asks you to do during this invitation time. Let's pray together. 
Father God, thank you so much for the opportunity you've given us to, to worship you, Lord, to study your word, and Lord, to see this incredible miracle, and Lord, to understand that you are the same God. You work the same way. Lord, we recognize that you don't need us. But Lord, we recognize that you like to spend time with us. And when we open our lives up and let you work through us, we are blessed beyond all measure. Lord, right now I pray for anybody in this room that doesn't know your son Jesus as Savior. Lord, give them the courage and the strength right now to be changed, not just for today, but for all eternity. And Lord, for all of us, may we no longer be content to just go through the motions. May we align our life and our desires with you. May we open our heart up and say, God, we're a tool to be used in your hands. Put us to work. Because, Lord, I know you've got great things that you want to show each of us. You are so good to us. We love you, Father. May you be honored and glorified as we, your people, are obedient now. We pray all this in your Son, Jesus' name.